So, hello, Professor Barnes. Hi, Anneli. It's been a while that we have um, kind of engaged and spoke through some things that have to do with psychology and decolonization. And thank you for welcoming us to your home. In the African sense of where we come from, we say Togozani, meaning that uh, we're greeting you and the Barnes and those who are part of this space. And so... Um, and thank you for creating this time. So today we are basically talking about psychology and decolonization. I know you're a prof in, in psychology. And in, in our university the, at UJ, we believe in core values of many things about diversity. And I believe that um, decolonization is part of diversity, of knowledge systems, and ways of how we talk and do um, psychology. But today I really want us to foster our minds into talking around decolonization. Maybe you can just do a bit of greetings and, and introduction as, um, as Professor Pounds. Thanks, Anil. It's lovely to engage with you again and uh, to work with you again. Um, Anil and I, uh, for those listening in, uh, did some work on decolonization and psychology and we put together a special issue as co-editors um, in 2018, but have engaged over the years on matters um, of African-centered psychology mm -hmm. as well as decolonization. Um, yeah, so it's lovely to be here. Um, like you said, I'm a professor of psychology. At the moment, I do uh, more administrative work in the <laughs> faculty <laughs> rather than <laughs> academic work, but yeah. uh, my interests and my heart and passion still lie mm -hmm. in psychology. Mm -hmm. And that's me. Yeah, I look forward to chatting with you. Great. Maybe I should do a bit of introduction for people to know that... Um, I'm Anela Siswana. I'm a clinical psychologist by profession. I am also a lecturer in the Department of Psychology. And I'm a traditional healer as well. <laughs> so I bring in all of these intersections of, of culture, tradition, um, queer understandings and, and, and all of that which you do. But I, I remember what we did in 2018 was such an amazing um, job of putting up um, articles and people commenting on different aspects of the economy. But I'd like us to take um, you to take us through your understanding and the sense of where we are around decolonization in higher education. Thanks, Anile. I, my take is that decolonization was a very, very powerful moment and movement within higher education and within psychology itself. Now, um, we must just be clear that a decolonization means different things to different people. Mm. Um, mm. And that we should avoid trying to define or um, box in our understandings of decolonization. I think as scholars in uh, the university, it's important for us to think through what this might mean, but also what... Uh, where we should be cautious and how we should take mm. these ideas forward. Mm. Um, so I would like to say that in higher education, the movement, uh, especially around the fees must fall and the subsequent mm. uh, issues that uh, we dealt with um, post fees must fall have really played an, an important part in how we mm. think mm. about decolonization mm. uh, in psychology in particular. Mm. Um, so, there are many, many, many um, things that we could talk about. Uh, and like I said earlier, it means different things to different people. For some, it was about um, replacing perhaps knowledge that had been produced in particular contexts with mm. another set of knowledges. For others, it's about reclaiming um, space within the academy and within psychology. For others, it was mm. around the values, uh, particularly around inclusivity and mm. respect. Mm. While for others, uh, it was around creating a new way and a new set of languages mm. to be able mm. to express ourselves um, within the discipline, discipline. and within mm. higher education in, mm. in particular. Mm. So um, that's the starting point, and I think it's had a, a, a huge effect huge impact, um, mm. especially as we head into new uh, socio-political uh, eras and mm. uh, priorities in the country, in higher education, in psychology. Um, yeah. Okay, great. And, and, and for me, to be quite specific, um, do you think uh, um, the discipline of psychology has responded quite well in relation to decolonization and probably to stretch it further to what we call African-centered psychology. Are these two, uh, 
things different or they are mutually exclusive mm. when we talk of decolonization in African centered psychology. Mm. So the first question I think is a good one. Um has psychology been slow? I think psychology traditionally has been <laughs> quite slow uh with with any any kind of critical uh movement. Um but I do think particularly at the University of Johannesburg there was a lot of change. There was a lot of um meaningful change I think in the curriculum mm-hmm. in the way we teach um in the way we engage students in the way in which we did research mm-hmm. um but a lot more could be done um i think african centered psychology is indeed part of a broader line of thinking of decolonization it's we should be careful of not conflating the two great um great. because great. there are there are other areas in which uh, decolonization can be claimed um especially with regards to what i call the silent revolutions mm-hmm. that often happen mm-hmm. in uh, mm-hmm. uh, the, the academy and here we're talking about curriculum change we're talking yes, about the way in which we engage in students i think most departments um at the university of johannesburg uh, have engaged with mm-hmm. ideas mm-hmm. of decolonization there are aspects of psychology in particular that um really did throw themselves into mm-hmm. into these debates mm-hmm. uh, and i'm using the term debate um uh purposefully here um n- again not to force ideas onto people mm-hmm. but really for people to engage scholars to engage academics to engage students to engage in the various debates to give them a more holistic feel of the potential for psychology mm. um and i think that's happened quite meaningfully mm-hmm. uh particularly in some uh subjects in psychology mm-hmm. uh subjects that come to mind as in uh, for example community psychology uh health psychology social psychology uh at the higher levels of professional training the mm. psychology uh, department introduced training in african centered psychology mm. and mm. people like you and ella have also brought in uh, nice ideas Great. around um around the training of of our students mm. um as well as the conscientization of academics around it. So mm. to me it's not a, a once off event and it's not <laughs> necessarily an mm. event that can mm. be put into a box but mm. it's uh, small steps quiet steps and mm. um mm. that and, and it's an ongoing project. Great. Uh I might might add that it's an ongoing project that started way before uh the term decolonization reentered um okay. the mm. discipline. So you know uh mm. in our recent history uh you look at movements around feminism you look at uh, movements around queer theory before that uh, critical theory political psychology um mm. all of those kinds of things that have mm. addressed um mm. m- many issues yeah so i was saying that uh, anele you know we also have to look at recent history um of the discipline and decolonization um you know dovetailed with a lot of important issues that the discipline was grappling with mm, to begin mm. with and there were two really important things the first was the question of relevance relevance um mm. that has been debated post apartheid um mm-hmm. and mm. obviously debated during a uh, apartheid the relevance of psychology in society mm. and the other is inclusivity and diversity mm. and that's those two issues really came together nicely around questions of decolonization Mm. Subsequent to that we've had to engage with uh questions of decolonization in relation to other uh major societal um uh events uh for example at the moment for IR at UJ yes, uh, and in society and how do we respond do we see these as mutually exclusive or do we see these as working together and of course I believe that we can see them mm. as working together mm. and can have important yes. impacts mm. um your second question Anele is around um whether we see african centered psychology as mutually exclusive um to decolonize and of course not yeah so <laughs> uh, of course not mm, um mm. but we 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 must see it in, in terms of a bigger picture yeah and and i think i like the idea of an african centered psychology and people often look ask how does this even look like mm. in in teaching and in practice and in all of that and for me the difficulty is always whenever we speak of african centered approaches there's no reference of academic scientific text um it's only now that um people like ratel mm. the the sibas mm. uh, ramoses and many others who are into that they're mm. trying to establish a sense of credibility mm. around defining what african centered psychology is 
what it, it is not because mm. the assumption is it's all a mumbo jumbo kind of a thing that there's no specific kind of science mm. that informs that but i believe that as africans we've always had our own ways of constructing knowledge and disseminating knowledge i'm no i know you are a big fan of us not being too protective of the kind of knowledge systems that we i mean articles are, are sold mm. um this is part of the decolonization movement and all of that and with african ways of knowing it's been oral tradition it has been these traditions that are non scientific mm. in a way so for some of us who are doing this work there's still so much of of credibility work and need mm. and relevance of normalizing mm. and theorizing thinking mm. differently i mean i don't know of any th- theory that is african centered mm. but there are certain ways in which we can draw from mm. from that aspect but i think on the first part you've helped us to understand what decolonization is and what it is not and some of the pitfalls that we need to be quite mindful of but i think now we can move on to the other segment around um probably some of your thoughts that you've probably thought about how i do this in in therapy of how it looks like because mm. it, beyond being an academic mm. there's a point where i have to sit down and how does this even look like i mean mm. i have to bring on the underground gang i call it the underground gang the ancestors <laughs> where they throwing information yeah. like tell this person this and all of that yeah. by the time someone sits already i have a script yeah. them i and again i always find this brand in that when i go to private practice there's been a point where when i started training i used to have my cloth so i would wrap it on my um, around me and i would be, uh, and i had my beads on and sometimes i would have beads and people already can already construct a narrative mm. by just seeing the beads mm. and so for me being in that space and like being being trained psychodynamically where anonymity and privacy mm. and all of that i've been quite conflicted mm. and for me where i'm at now uh i'm curious to actually um hear my colleagues as to their impressions mm. of um how do i experience this mm. maybe you can mm. start there yeah no that's absolutely fascinating and elena i think what you um bring to the discussion is the practice side of things the as well as the <laughs> academic side of things but maybe i could also just get your thoughts on how you see the colonization of psychology um linking with african centered psychology <laughs> uh and then we can move on to mm. the details mm. of how that looks in practice mm. for me as i've said that the, the the difficulty of what i'm experiencing there's a post that i saw on facebook and twitter mm. a clinical psychologist that was advertising herself so what she did she collaborated where you call it umsamo where people go in bumbeni and all of that this is I call it the underground office. <laughs> <laughs> so the underground <laughs> office was in the same space. Why underground? Your underground gang and underground office. The underground office. is basically a, a chilled word of saying ancestors. Oh okay, okay, okay. <laughs> 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 this this so you call it the underground yeah. gang. So um it's it's the ancestral office. So she it, she has yeah. that in the same space she has a private room. Now the debate there was isn't this a conflict of interest? or isn't this dual therapy mm-hmm. and in the way of how we understand or oh, integrative therapy mm. so if there's integrative therapy there's dual therapy and there's conflict of interest obviously from the west the colonized way of looking at things one would then say and argue that this is conflict of interest and for me that was the point of actually saying actually mm. this is a conversation now mm about how this looks like in practice because mm. we we are putting academic terms mm. nice words into it but what is actually decolonizing therapy mm. Mm. um because we all know what we know which is very colonized which is very eurocentric mm. now for me in practice as an example what is decolonization it means the first thing that i do instead of saying good morning i say tobozan mm. or i say kamaku mm. or i say makos already one who understands that they already can identify with that mm. and how my space looks like it's very decolonized mm. as much as i don't use the same room and same space where i do my underground work and at the same time the psychological work but they are i call it sacred um elements 
that are indicative of that. One of it is my identity. You see the beards, mm-hmm. and I'll have my sniff, the the tobacco mm-hmm. there. I'll have my mat that that is there. Already, that suggests a decolonized way of looking at this, where people are already looking for a long chair, mm. a long couch, mm. or going to be ask how you're feeling. Mm. And for me, I always ask unjani or ninjani, mm. meaning that I'm not only asking you, but the response that I get, there's a recognition of the other and all of that. Mm. But by the time people come to see me, already mm. they've done their research. Mm. So there have been times, Brendan, where I have to take off my shoes because probably the gang is saying, no, 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 this time mm. around. So I've had to negotiate space. Mm. And automatically there's a conversation already. Some people would even then ask, what does it mean for you to have this in this room? But I'm very wary of saying that the person that you have came to see is a registered clinical psychologist and I'm also registered with the BHF. So don't be worried. You will only get to see the psychologist, but my identity already in the room mm. introduces a decolonized way of working mm. around these issues. Mm. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's incredible. Um, you know, often, like you say, we get caught up in concepts uh, perhaps theories, and that's, that's a very important. Mm, mm. And perhaps in the university space, you know, thinking about broad concepts, but how it plays out in practice is really important. And so, yeah, thank yeah. you for that. Mm, um, mm. I was also just maybe coming back to your teaching because I know you do do a lot of teaching mm-hmm. uh, in African centered psychology and in therapy and so forth. Uh, you've also written in sort of social psychology and critical psychology. Um, but I, uh, I, I just wanted to get a sense from you about some of the challenges of the, um, the teaching space and teaching mm. this kind of thing. I think maybe if just briefly touch on from practice side, mm. my, my therapist asked me, how are you feeling about doing this kind of work that is non-normative or non-hegemonic? Mm. I, I, f- I sit with guilt of the colonized mind mm. and the colonized background. Those shall not do this in, in psychodynamic. I told mm. of the frame, you shouldn't do this and do all of that. But I've had to dance with my guilt and pleasure of doing what I love. Mm. And this is, I'm, not, I'm doing no harm. Mm. So even with my teaching perspective, like with the master's class, they've thoroughly enjoyed, and most of them, it's for the first time in their academic life, mm. being introduced to notions of, African psychology, mm. what this thing is. And so, and again, there's a theoretical basis of the work that has been done so far. Mm. And people like Ratel have written a book about mm. what so African psychology looks like mm. and what it, it is not. So there's a great excitement from students mm. of receiving local knowledge. Mm. And again, reading mm. scholars that is so accessible. Mm. Um, yes, we do have the Walter Mignolos and, and the rest that have written extensively about decolonization, but now to get the works of mm. people that we know, that teach us in our, mm. in our classrooms mm. and all of that, it becomes more amplified for students. Mm. So my experience of, as a lecturer doing this, it has been quite an amazing and liberating experience, even for me, that I'm not feeling guilty at the end of the day that when it's my students are confronted later in practice, with African realities. Mm. I mean, how we construct and understand the DSM. Mm. It's socially constructed in pathology and psychiatry. Mm. But then again, I'm able to teach students about possibilities that beyond seeing this as psychosis, Mm. there is the possibility Mm. that there could be witchcraft, that there could be these other elements into it. And also me as a psychologist and as an academic in the room, with students that it's so accessible for them that they have someone who's actually doing this in practice. Mm. So I'm able to draw from my lived experience, Mm. from my experience as a practicing psychologist, from theory Mm. and grounding this Mm. within a particular foundation that it makes it so accessible for students to to even try it out to say, Mm. when I'm looking at personality disorders, what are some of the terms and notions and metaphors that Mm. we use to describe a personality disorder. Mm. In fact, what is depression in an African context? Because one may not come with the actual clinical words in mm. practice, 
But they may bring metaphors like there's something in my shoulders, mm. my head is spinning, and all of mm. these things. Mm. So I'm able to draw from local knowledges mm. and integrate them into theory. Mm. And beyond than just that, there's also the advantage of bringing praxis mm. that makes it accessible for students to mm. relate with that. Even though for some, it, it, it always feels like, as a white student, do I need to know this? Mm. Race then comes in is African psychology or African centered psychology for blacks mm. or for whites, mm. or some middle ground, <laughs> some which middle I, ground, you know, you know, yeah. which I'd love to explore with you perhaps now. Um, <laughs> you know, th- th- there would be some who would feel that, um, you know, it seems either or you've got you know, Western and you've got African centered, oh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and perhaps we feed into that, but uh, just some of your thoughts, Anile, about. You know, making um, African-centered psychology um, and associated practices um, more accessible, perhaps, or um, mm. you know, more available to to many. Your thoughts? I think the problem that that makes it too for us to to stumble or struggle with this concept of African psychology, it's other disciplines outside that. I mean, there are many people who may identify with different kind of religious. Um, convictions, it could be Christian, it could be any. But those ideologies are, are, are socially accepted as normative ways of how to do things. Now, being a Sangoma or a traditional healer is problematically constructed in society. Mm. It's either you are a witch mm. or you're working with dark powers and all of those mm. things. So already with African psychology, there's no woo-ha about it in the literature mm. or it's only known in Africa or in mm. South Africa. So it's not a hegemonic knowledge kind of knowledge system that everybody knows about it. Mm. So the already w- there will be reservations and apprehension mm. around people's responses in relation to that. But the bigger problem is that again for, for African psychology or for African centered psychology to have more credibility there's needed to be. There's a need for more write-ups. I mean, we have people who have probably thought of African mythology or African ways of knowing and understanding, like Credo Mutua, mm. but his work is deemed as mythological mm. or kind of philosophical in a way. But until we have credible work and research that's centered around that, like mm. I have taken a personal responsibility. Most of my students, in their dissertation there is an element of an African perspective so as to bring value into the one of my students is doing uh, work around experiences of traditional queer healers, Mm. right? And there's a part where she speaks about African epistemology as a legitimate form of knowing, as a way of understanding African realities. And so for me, practically, Mm. from a praxis perspective and also from an academic perspective, to to give credibility it is when we can start doing studies mm. that have an empirical sense of understanding s- uh, participants' subjective experience of what this is, how the experience is, and all of that. Mm. That's the closest that I can come mm. to mm. in response to what you've just highlighted. Mm. 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 That's really interesting. I mean, I think you've picked up on a couple of issues, but the one thing you've said uh, repeatedly is the need for more writing. Need for more writing. Uh, the, re- yeah. the need you mentioned, credible, credible writing. Um, but um, I just wanted to get your sense of how we foster that, how we... I, I'm absolutely <laughs> delighted that over the past few years, we now have at least a dozen scholars who I mm. believe are writing beautifully mm. uh, in the mm. field mm. Mm. and that mm. we actually have a, 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 a corpus of literature that we can at least start to think this through. Mm. We also, of course, have a bigger literature, uh, pan-African literature, literature from the diaspora Mm -hmm. uh, to draw on. But yeah, what are your thoughts about how to foster um, the writing of African-centered psychology? I think the beginning starts with teaching African psychology. And and, and instead of doing it in silos in the way that we are doing now, that in the department is known to be someone else's interest, I think it can be fostered as as a core module. Mm. Um, that each psychology student would be registered for African-centered psychology or whatever African-centered, like we have done mm. in the faculty, introducing that course. Mm. But it bring brought more to psychology being made a, 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 
a module that students will then start uh, engaging with that mm. from its earliest first year. Mm. So if you can do that, I- then students would know there is this possibility. And in, in, if in our postgraduate studies, mm. we then encourage students to look for topics and subjects that have to do with something along the lines of that. So from a, a teaching perspective, and targeting it from as early as, as undergraduate, mm. and then foster that. Then also things, I mean, with um, people like Chilis and many others that have written uh, uh, on decolonizing methodologies, mm. starting from as, as that as well at mm. postgraduate level mm. as to what do we mean by when we speak of uh, decolonizing methodologies? Mm. What does that look like? Mm. And how we can apply? Because as long as we know Linda Smith her work is incredible, mm. but it's less evident in students' work, mm. either in when they're writing theoretical um, frameworks or uh, possible paradigms mm. of thinking about mm. that. So from a teaching perspective and mm. research, I see potential, and this is where mm. we can start targeting and, and, and foster mm. these ideals and ways of thinking about African psychology mm. and the whole broad concept of decolonization. Mm. Mm. Oh, that's great, and I think, you mm. know, the... the the starting point of teaching and introducing it early is um, possibly also to mm. grow the cohort of people mm-hmm. who, who would mm. go on to become mm. uh, academics mm. or scholars or researchers mm. or mm. practitioners mm. Um, mm. thinking about these issues. I have one final question for you. It's a <laughs> tough question, Anneli. What do you think are some of the traps, uh, potential traps, um, of thinking in an African-centered psychology way? I'm thinking scholarship. Okay. Um, I think for me, the trap is the need to over-justify <laughs> what decolonization and, and, and African psychology means. Like, it feels like it's, it's an, an effort uh, to make people believe this thing. It's more like you're selling a product, right? And the scientific community, like, nah, they don't trust this. <laughs> so trust with this. And uh, mm. I kept on using the word credibility. Mm. So the, the danger thing is that... Um, we we uh, we may go through the trap of over explaining what this is, mm. and so that at the end of the day, people would get would get would lose the essence mm. of what this is. At the same time, is it will always be compared to mm. the hegemonic way. We know psychology to be psychodynamic, mm. to be narrative, to be CBT, to be all of this and mm. this and that. So it will always be against the grain of, mm. and because it is what it is. Psychology is that. Now, in terms of practice, well, then people would then bring these issues. Is this human therapy? Is this integrative therapy? Which is for me, in my argument, mm. it's integrative. Um, but this, this, there's no sense of even scientific or Western integration of what integrative therapy is. Mm. There is no sense of what this is. One could tell you, use this, a bit of that, and bring all of these things together. So what's wrong with me when I bring a bit of this and that and that. Mm. And for instance, like I usually say, Mr. V, for me, when people, when I refer clients to psychiatrists when they are depressed, it's fine. Whenever Mm. I see that this is not just depression and the underground gang Mm. amplifies the Mm. narrative, I'm able to say, go to Mkulu Mang Mang or Gogo Hu, who's going to help you unpack this. However, because I've got the local knowledge, it could look like this. Mm. Now, that, what I'm going to suggest is not in... An MDT involves a medical doctor, a psychiatrist, an OT, a social worker, and all of that. Now, for me, my MDT is expanded. It involves a traditional healer, a herbalist that can start prescribe a certain type of medication. So, because that is not in the norm, that will be seen as a problem. Again, will people will speak of ethics. Um, is it ethical to do this? It's ethical because I'm doing no harm. So another problem is, in terms of practice, there is no right or wrong way of a manual unless we can start writing about the manual. Something one person asked me, in the, in the underground world or in the ancestral world, do we have a DSM? <laughs> and I said, no ways, we can't have a DSM there because it, this is subjective. And it's different. Mm. It comes in different shapes and different forms. In the academy, everything needs to go for trials. It goes needs to go for validation, for peer reviews. 
Now there am I am taking my paper to Brandon to integrate to uh, to review integrative therapy from an African perspective. Chances are, if you're not aware of that, you're gonna say this is nonsense. Mm. <laughs> okay. So no, having no reference of this mm. from the scientific way of how we understand science, that's another problem. In another thing is it will always be compared to, and again, we will trust who is writing this. Mm. Even amongst African scholars, um, there are politics of saying that nah, this one is superficial, mm. uh, this one is not touching this. And uh, one of the professors wrote a very critical um, article about um, African psychology, and he was murdered mm. for his ideals and notions. And that's what that's how we saw it. And so within there, there are politics mm. of who is who, who has the right. Who has the legitimacy of that? When a colleague from the West writes about African psychology, that's been questioned. So those are some of the things. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, some of it is, is complicated, and I think oh, uh, it's complex issues um, and issues that are certainly much needed on the agenda uh, yeah. in the debates mm-hmm. in 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 the academic discourse. And uh, you know, I really look forward to. Uh, Engaging more on the topic Definitely, and uh, yes, yeah, yes. engaging with you. Thanks. And you see more of the work that I do around um, how this possibly looks like. Mm. And I've been getting a lot of interviews mm. um, and podcasts around mm. um, how do I resolve this? And I think it requires a, a different kind of bold generation like mm. us mm. to question and position this way of looking at knowledge systems at looking at practice and all of that. Mm. But um, because of time and other constraints, and thank you for this great conversation, mm. it's always good to translate what we write about mm. and make it accessible for even people that may not have access to buy even the special issue that we did. Yeah. But this, it's on YouTube, it's available. Mm. And for the faculty to see the kind of beautiful work that mm. we do as a mm. department mm. and as a university, mm. thank you for that. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you Anneli. So